first grade doesn't get to be as fun as anything else. Good morning, viewers at home, and uh, welcome to our uh, Hangout on Air. We are in our Madagascar exhibit here at the Bronx Zoo, part of the Wildlife Conservation Society. My name is Megan Malaska, and I am incredibly excited to be sharing and hosting this uh, session. Madagascar is one of my favorite places to want to be at because it's one of our warmest indoor exhibits considering it's freezing outside in New York City right now. And we also have some of the coolest animals I think on the planet here. We are at our red ruffed lemur exhibit and today we have a lot of fun stuff to share with you. I wanted to give a shout out to our three schools that are joining us. So we have our uh, Robert Moses Lower School, their first grade class. We also have Detroit Achievement Academy's second grade class from Detroit. And Mount Olive Township School, they're a third grade class in Mount Olive, New Jersey. So today we have um, two speakers. We have Dr. Chris Golden, who is the director of our HEAL program here at WCS. And we also have Cindy Maurer, who is one of our wild animal keepers at the Bronx Zoo. Um, just to give you a little bit of an inside scoop about the Wildlife Conservation Society, which we also call WCS here, it is... Um, many people are familiar with our five parks. So we have our Bronx Zoo, we have our Central Park Zoo, Queen Zoo, New York Aquarium and Prospect Park Zoo. But we are also a worldwide global organization where we have projects all around the world. We have about 500 projects in about 60 countries. So we are all over the place and you'll get to hear a little bit about the projects that are going on in Madagascar as well as the animals that are here. Our, our lemurs are very active this morning. So uh, first off, before we go any further, um, and you can also send in your questions. You can send in your questions into our app um, through the Hangout Plus or you can also tweet them to us. So you can tweet them uh, at hashtag WCSLemursHOA. And I'm going to now introduce one of our first speakers, Chris Golden. Thank you, and I just wanted to say hello to everyone. I'm really pleased to be able to see Mr. Brodo's class in New Jersey and Jen McMillan's class in Detroit. And a special shout out to uh, Jeremy's class in Providence, Rhode Island at Moses Brown School and especially to my niece Lucy who's in that class. And I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be presenting here. I love the Madagascar exhibit at the Bronx Zoo. It's a really special place for me because they've actually created a lot of the habitat that I've been living in for the past 10 years in Madagascar. I've been working in Marwan Setra, which is in the Makira and Mashwala region. And these lemurs that you see behind me, the red ruffed lemurs, are actually lemurs that are found within the Mashwala forest. They're a very special type of lemur. When I first started going to Madagascar in 1999, there were only 32 known species of lemurs. And over the past 15 years, there are now more than 100 species of lemurs that are known in the wild. And so this is a really exciting thing for you kids to really realize is that there's so much more to discover, there's so much more to understand, there's so much more to find out. And I became interested in Madagascar when I was in third grade. So at the exact age of the school in New Jersey and a few years away for some of these other schools, that's really when I began my interest with Madagascar. That's where my passion really started to really learn more about this place. So now I want to just tell you a little bit more about my work. My work started off really focusing, just trying to learn about lemurs, learn about G, learn about where they lived, what they ate. And now it's trying to learn more about how we can protect lemurs, how we can conserve lemurs, so that we can still see lemurs well into the future. And so just a few fun facts about lemurs. You can see behind us, these are the red ruffed lemurs. And so let me teach you how to say this type of species in Malagasy. So the people in Madagascar are called Malagasy, and the language is also called Malagasy. It's a unique language that's most closely related to Indonesian, and yet it's a country that's within Africa. It's the fourth largest island in the world, and it's a very, very special island. Most of the animals are unique there. And in fact, there's 175,000 species that are just found within Madagascar. And what a species is, it's a unique type of plant, animal, or other thing. And so this red ruff lemur is just one of those 175,000 special species that are found within Madagascar. And so the way to say this animal behind me in Malagasy is Atarena. It's a very long word, but the simple, broad term for all lemurs in Madagascar is varka. And so I'm wondering if we could just take a brief pause so that the classrooms can maybe try to repeat that. Can you say varka? 
Good job. And so now let me officially welcome you and also say in Malagasy, Tunga Sua. This is how you say welcome in Malagasy. Tunga Sua. All right. Good job, everyone. And so now let me dive in and let me ask the classrooms a question. What is your favorite type of food? Chicken parm. <laughs> I think we heard a chicken parmesan from some of the classrooms in New Jersey. Great, so these are really good answers. We're getting things like chicken and chicken parm and pizza. And this is very, very different from some of the favorite foods in Madagascar. If you ask local Mali, oh, and you can even hear the lemurs, they're trying to talk to you guys in the classroom. Hopefully you guys can all hear that. If you ask local Malagasy what their favorite food is in the region where I live, almost everybody would say rice. Rice is really this critically important food that provides them with all of their energy. And then from a meat perspective, You'd be surprised. Across the board, actually, they have a lot in common with you. Chicken is their number one taste preference, and yet many people don't have access to chicken because it's so expensive and it's so difficult to raise. And so many people are actually forced into eating lemurs. And so this is part of the research that I do is that people are hunting animals for food, and yet we see these animals as so important to biodiversity, so important to understanding the habitat and the reason why this forest is such a beautiful place that we want to protect it and yet local people are hunting it out of need and so this presents a really interesting problem and that's one of the things that I'm really trying to solve jointly with the Wildlife Conservation Society's office and team in Madagascar and so just a few fun facts before we bring on the zookeeper that is going to be working with us also today. Lemurs are really unique species of primates. So monkeys and apes are also primates, and lemurs too are a type of primate. And what's special about lemurs, and what I think is really interesting, is that all lemur species, all 101 species, are matriarchal. And does anybody know what the term matriarchal means? No? Okay, well, let me ask you another question. How many people speak Spanish? Do you know what the word madre means? Mom. Mom, mother, exactly. And so what lemurs are, they're matriarchal, which means they are run by a head female. The female and the lead female is the boss of this entire social group. And so there's very likely a boss female behind us that runs this entire social group. And so I think that's a really interesting fact. And something very interesting specifically about the red rough lemurs behind me are what they eat. So lemurs generally have a very broad and diverse diet. Some might eat insects, some might eat exclusively plants, and others eat fruit. And across that spectrum of different types of diets, the red rough lemur eats a greater percentage of fruit in their diet than any other lemur. It's very close to around 95% of their diet is entirely fruit. Other interesting facts about lemurs are that they're split between diurnal and nocturnal. Does anybody know what those words mean? Yes. 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 Yes? Tell me what nocturnal means. Nocturnal means they sleep at night. Good job. Exactly. So the way that you've described it makes it sound a lot like me on the weekend sometimes is that I sleep during the day and then I'm awake at night. And so that's exactly what nocturnal means. And so there's a lot of different interesting characteristics and descriptions that make lemurs really interesting and fun animals to learn about. And that's really what I've been trying to do in Madagascar in order to protect them as a species that we can continue to see well into the future. And so now I'm going to bring on Cindy Maurer, who's one of the zookeepers here. Oh, before I do that, we're going to see if there's any questions that anyone has for me. Great, Jeremy, we'll see if you have any questions for me. Do red rough lemurs use their whiskers the same way as cats do? You can go up to the computer and you can say, 
Go ahead. Do red ruff lemurs use their whiskers the same way as cats do? You know, that's a really great question for Cindy, who will be coming on next. Let's see if the audience has another question. How old can they live to be? That's a really great question. And actually, for animals that are so small, typically they only have very, very short lives. And yet lemurs are an exception to that rule. So the lemurs behind me are some of the largest lemurs in Madagascar. They're around 8 pounds. And yet they can have very, very long lives. Typically, lemurs can live anywhere from 10 to 40 years. And typically, for these species, they might live around 20 years, with exceptions being for a very, very old red rough lemur, maybe 25 or 30 years old. We'll take one more question. Can red rough lemurs communicate with other species of lemurs? That's a really great question. And so... I want to be able to try to tell you that in person with some of the sounds that you were hearing behind me. Did anyone hear all of the hoots and, and shrieks that the red ruff lemur was doing behind me? That is a way of communicating. And so they were communicating with the other red ruff lemurs because there are no other lemurs in this exhibit. And yet in the wild, those same sorts of calls and cries are used to defend their fruit resources against other lemurs or to identify if there is a fusa nearby that they might need to protect some of their young or run away or flee from this predator. Hopefully you all know what the FUSA is from the movie Madagascar. And so they definitely can communicate with other species. It's not exactly like talking like humans do. And yet there are certain types of calls, different pitches, different tones of the way that they use their voice that can identify certain types of threats or food or other things that they want to communicate. Great. And so now we're going to bring on Cindy Maurer, who's the zookeeper here, who will be able to tell you about... Uh, all of the details of dealing with lemurs inside the Bronx Zoo. Okay, sorry, it's moving again. Um, we're going to introduce Cindy, and she's going to answer that question about the whiskers, too. So, Cindy, come on over. And Cindy is lucky enough to work with these animals on a, on a regular basis, so we're all jealous of her job. Hi, guys. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning, everyone. Ah, there it is. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you guys about our red rough lemurs here in the Madagascar building at the Bronx Zoo. Um, but before we even start talking about them and talking about themselves, uh, to answer the question about the whiskers. Um, these guys, even though they have that long nose that you would think of with a dog or a cat. They have that long snout and it's kind of, the nose looks kind of wet and it doesn't have any fur on it. These guys are primates. So they are going to explore the uh, world a little differently than a dog or cat. So you know how a cat will feel things around with their whiskers. They'll, they'll put their whiskers forward and if the space is too small, if, they, if their whiskers touch, they think the space is going to be probably too small. Well, a lemur doesn't exactly have that. They do have that long nose, so they are going to smell around in their environment. Their olfactory, or their uh, ability to smell, is very strong. So they're going to smell things, and you see that they have those really, really big eyes. They're going to look at things first before um, anything else. So. Does that answer the whisker question a little bit? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I became a zookeeper. Is anybody here interested in working with animals when they grow up? Yeah. Or do you not know yet? That's okay. <laughs> well, oh, great. Okay. Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I knew that I wanted to work with animals, but I didn't know what I always came to the I always came to the Bronx Zoo when I was a little girl I just loved watching all the animals but only when I went to college that I realized that I can work with animals for a living so I studied environmental studies I studied uh, anthropology focusing on primate behavior so what these guys do and I also studied marine biology after that I became a zookeeper 
zookeeper after volunteering and interning at zoos. I became a zookeeper and I've been working here at the Bronx Zoo for over eight years and I've had the ultimate privilege of working in the Madagascar building. Not only is it a beautiful island that I hope to see one day, uh, but it, the Bronx Zoo has recreated some wildlife habitats in the Bronx Zoo, so if you are in the area, you can come and get a glimpse of what Madagascar is like. And behind me, the Red Ruff exhibit is, it looks similar, I mean, it looks very similar to what the Red Ruff, uh, what the Red Ruffs would experience in the wild. And if you can see, we're on level with the trees. Right? We're not looking at the ground, we're looking into the trees, we're looking into the vines. And that's because in the wild, red rough lemurs are going to be living really high up. They live in what's called the canopy. So they can live anywhere between 50 and 80 feet up in the air, sometimes even higher. So you see that guy all the way up there? Is he in view? No? Oh. Well, you saw that they were walking around on the branches. There we go. They love being on top of the branches, walking on top of the branches. That's where they are most comfortable. So in this exhibit, we have six red ruff lemurs. Um, and as Chris mentioned, it is matriarchal. Do you guys remember what matriarchal means? No. No. <laughs> Honest answer. I like it. <laughs> So matriarchal, again, means that uh, it is uh, the society, their families are kind of ruled by the moms, they're ruled by the ladies. So we have one female, one girl in the group, and we have five boys. And Chris is right, the ones that were, the one of the ones that was vocalizing before was one of the females, absolutely. Um, and they're really, really cool to work with, not only because it's a beautiful exhibit, but they're super interesting animals. They uh, live in the Maswala Forest, so they, um, they only live there. That's the only place they live. Not only do they only live in Madagascar, but they only live there. So they are pretty endangered since the Maswala Forest um, is one of the largest remaining forests in Madagascar, but it's only the largest remaining forest because so much of the other forests have been disturbed or destroyed. So that's why people like Chris and organizations like WCS are working so hard in Madagascar to make sure that the forest and all of the landscapes are preserved so the animals and the plants can keep on living there and you and your grandchildren can keep on seeing them and knowing what they are. Oh my goodness. So the question was if I could tell you how we care for the animals. Absolutely. Uh, well, caring for these guys and caring for all the animals here is a full-time job, let me tell you. It is a labor of love. Um, so we do very important things for the animals, such as feed them, we make sure that they have water, we make sure that they're happy. And then you have to ask, well, what does a happy lemur look like? Can, can you guys tell me what you think a happy lemur looks like? Yes. Yes? Okay, go ahead. Yes? yes? Well, okay, give me one example of what you think a happy lemur looks like. Smiling. Can you act it out? What do you think a happy lemur looks like? A smiling lemur. A smile. <laughs> That's what a happy person looks like. That's what I'm doing right now. You guys are making me smile. <laughs> Well, sometimes when a lemur smiles, it might not be so friendly. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be vocalizing. So they'll probably be vocalizing to let you know or let a predator know you might want to back away. To me, what a happy lemur looks like is kind of what you've been seeing here. So 50% of the time, a lemur is going to be, a red rough lemur is going to be sleeping. So if they're sleeping, that might mean they're happy. <laughs> I know I'm pretty happy when I sleep. I don't know about you guys. 30% of the time, they are going to be eating. So did you see the, all the lemurs eating just before? Did you guys see that? Yeah. yeah. Those lemurs look pretty happy when they were eating? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They were. 
And the other 20% of the time, lemur, red rough lemurs are going to be moving around. So you guys saw that too. So they're doing all the things that they would do in the wild. Something very important that zookeepers do is we provide enrichment for them. Does anybody know what enrichment is? Show of hands? Yes. Show of hands? Okay, we have a couple of hands. That is great. I am very impressed. So enrichment is anything that promotes a natural behavior in an animal. So for our red rough lemurs, we want to make sure that they're doing all those things. They have the ability to sleep comfortably, comfortably. They have the ability to move around the way they would in the wild in this expansive exhibit. And we want to make sure that we would create puzzles and ways um, to stimulate their minds the way that they would get normally. So we give them sometimes puzzle feeders. So can you imagine? You guys you guys have Kong toys for your dogs or cats, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So a Kong toy is an enrichment item because it, get, it lets the dog um, hunt for its food, right? And it's trying to get its food. Maybe there's peanut butter in the Kong. I don't know. And a cat. You know how cats have mice to play around with? Yeah. So a cat is going to be hunting. They love to hunt. So what do you think they're doing with that little toy mouse? They're hunting that mouse. They're catching it and they're eating it. So we provide similar toys for lemurs, but in a way that a lemur would find it enriching. Thanks, Cindy. So I'm going to keep you on camera so you can answer these questions. We're having some technical difficulty with Ms. McMillan's um, class in Detroit Achievement Academy, but I have their questions, so I'm going to ask you And as I'm a second grader. So the first question is, do lemurs hug and fight? Uh, do lemurs hug and fight? Now that is an interesting question. So lemurs don't hug per se the way we would, but a way that a lot of primates um, show their, I guess you could say, love for each other is they groom each other. So that builds relationships among the uh, individuals. So for example, um, we can have, well, they're sleeping now, they're resting, very normal. <laughs> um, but they would groom each other, they would pick through their fur and make sure their fur is nice and tidy, there's no bugs or dirt in it, and when they're doing that, they're building a bond with each other. So that's kind of their equivalent of a hug. And fighting, that's an interesting question. See, a lot of animals, even though you may see a lot of stuff on YouTube about animals fighting and all that stuff, animals use fighting as the absolute last resort. What an animal wants to do, if, if they get into a fight, that means they could be injured. And that could be really, really hard on the animal's survival. So an animal wants to do everything before it starts to fight. What the red rough lemurs are going to do is they're going to use these big vocalizations that Chris was talking about and that you guys were hearing to ward off predators and to ward off other groups of red rough lemurs. They're going to do what's called a barking all in unison. It's so loud. It's almost deafening. And that is to tell all the other red rough lemurs in the area to back away. This is my territory. And it's to tell the predators, like the fusa or an eagle, that they should not be coming around because they are big and bad. Thanks, Cindy. So we have some questions from Mr. Brodo's um, Mount Olive Township uh, Elementary School. Oh, yes, we have three questions. OK, let's have one first, and we'll probably have Chris answer this one. Are the lemurs active, and how do they play? That's a great question. So the lemurs, as you could see, go in between active and passive behavior. The active behaviors are when they are eating, grooming, playing, fighting. All of those behaviors are considered active, whereas the passive behaviors mainly consist of sleeping and resting. And so the playing behaviors can be any type of games that they're doing with each other. It's play fighting, it is bouncing around on the trees, jumping from limb to limb, because these types of lemurs specifically, and many of the other species, are what we call arboreal, 
which means they are based almost entirely on the trees and very, very hesitant to go down onto the ground. And so a lot of their playing involves jumping from branches to branches and play fighting with each other so that they can gain those skills. Can we have the next question? Sure. Elijah and who else? John. John. Elijah. Yeah. Elijah, make sure you're close to the microphone. Are lemurs similar to monkeys? So that's a great question. I think that I mentioned this very quickly before, but lemurs are types of primates, and so are monkeys, and so are apes. And so primates is the broad category that captures all of them. So things like chimpanzees, gorillas, tamarins, colobus monkeys, all of these different types of monkeys, apes, and lemurs, all are different types of primates. So lemurs aren't exactly monkeys, but they're very closely related. Great, and we just have one more. Great. How does the so society work to conserve the lemur's habitat? You know, that's a really great question because I think the role of WCS in conserving the habitat and conserving lemurs is such an important role, both for the Bronx Zoo and for Wildlife Conservation Society's global programs. Having lived in Madagascar for 15 years, I can tell you that it's not always the most happy place. For me, I love being there, I love working there, and yet there are so many threats to the forest. There are things that are happening like illegal logging and illegal hunting and different things that destroy the habitat or destroy the lemur populations, or you see a lot of people that aren't healthy because they don't have enough food to eat, or they don't have enough health care, all of these things are actually quite sad and depressing. And so the things that the Wildlife Conservation Society is doing is both protecting the habitat and also trying to improve the lives of local people living near the habitat, living near the forest, so that they don't need to rely in a very strong way on the resources that they can get from the forest. And so what the society actually does, what WCS actually does locally, is both monitor and protect the forest, but also try to improve the lives of local people that surround the forest. And that second part of it, in terms of improving the lives of local people, is really the direction that my work goes into. And so I learn a lot about the food that they eat, what type of health they have, and to try to discover ways that we can improve their health, improve the foods that they eat, so that they can live happy and strong lives just like we do here in New York and in the rest of the US. And then, as our last wrap-up question, if you two could both come in the shot, is what can our viewers at home do to make an impact with and help out? That's a great question. And for me, as I mentioned, I really got all of my interest in Madagascar when I was still in third grade. So I think that it's so important for you to really really take in everything that your teachers are, are teaching you about right now because you never know. There might be a topic that you become passionate about and really try to change the world with that specific topic later on in your life, just like I'm trying to do right now. And so I think that there's a way of getting interested in topics that could bring you very far afield to places like Madagascar, but there's also so much that you can do right at home. And so whether it's getting involved very simply in your school's recycling program or in other parts of your community to try to protect local stream habitats or local ocean habitats or local forest habitats. There are so many different ways of getting involved and I would be happy to take emails from any of you students out there if you have specific questions of how to get involved uh, and then we'll also see what Cindy might have to say. Well, I agree with absolutely everything that Chris said. Um, it's so important to learn as much as you can right now and continue learning because you never know what um, what you're going to find out you're passionate about. I know that when I was your age, what I did, well, it was the time when you wrote away to things instead of emailing, but I would write away to every organization and asking, ask them for more information, ask them for ways that I can help because when you're younger, you don't have the opportunity to do volunteer work, but that doesn't mean that you can't help out. You can still write letters you can still get involved and find ways to get involved. And you know what? Visiting your local zoo 
and learning about animals that way is also a really great way because then you get to see the animals. You get to understand them better when you're watching them. You get to you get to understand them better, and when you understand them better, it makes you feel more for them. And I know that's how I got started working in the zoo, because I would just spend hours in front of exhibits at the Bronx Zoo just watching the animals and understanding what each of the individual animals were doing. And it was just it was such a cool experience, and it got me to where I am today. And I hope that you guys find the same passion, whether it's with animals or not. Super. So that's our hangout for today. I wanted to say a huge, huge, huge thank you to our two experts here, uh, Cindy Maurer and Chris Golden. We really appreciate your time, and you were fabulous today. Um, our lemurs were a little bit sleepy, so we'll, that's okay. You can watch this um, recorded version on our YouTube channel, and there will be more hangouts in the future. And if you're feeling chilly and you want to warm up, you can come to our Madagascar exhibit here at the Bronx Zoo. You might even run into Cindy and see our, our lemurs up and close and personal. So thank you so much, and have a great day to our three schools. Thank you so much for participating and all of our live viewers at home. Thank you. <laughs>